So hi guys, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Shorendu Gupta from uh, Department of Theoretical Physics, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in our QSTM Zoominar series. This is 74th Zoominar in the series. And uh, we are thankful to Professor Gupta for uh, giving his contribution in this forum. And we all are welcoming uh, Professor Gupta. Uh, so you can start uh, right now. Thanks, Shantan. Uh, pleasure to give this talk. So this talk is going to be about effective field theory. And uh, I'm going to talk about effective field theories of particular examples in at high temperature. Okay. Now, this is a subject that I've uh, worked, it's kind of matured slowly. Uh, I've been working on this little aspects of this over many years. So I'll just put up a list of various people who have collaborated with me on various aspects of this. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are across India and abroad who have uh, contributed to little bits and pieces and large bits and pieces as well. Okay, so here's a kind of a semi-complete list. Okay, now this talk I have organized into little, little pieces, some little bit about what is hot matter, then I'll talk about effective theories, introduce them, then I'll tell you how to construct an EFT, then write down a simple EFT for hot matter, then start adding detail, but I won't do too much of detail and I'll stop it. Okay, so let me now start on the real stuff. Okay, you know that the universe started a long time ago and it was small and hot to begin with. And as it expanded to its present size, it cooled quite rapidly. Okay, the shape of the present universe was actually set fairly early. Okay, in one picosecond after what we think of as the Big Bang, electrons got their mass. Okay, before that, everything, the physics looked different. Okay, in a microsecond after the birth, the protons and neutrons formed. That's the region where most of my talk is going to concentrate. In about a minute after the birth of the universe, heavier elements started to form. That's nucleosynthesis. Okay. And much later, about 380,000 uh, years ago, atoms formed out of this nuclei. Okay, and at that point, when atoms formed, then photons began to propagate through the universe. And we could see what was happening very far out. So now when we look at the universe, we can see photons that have come to us from that far back. Everything about the universe earlier has to be deduced from much more subtle observations. For example, gravity waves, neutrinos, okay? And there, these observations uh, you need to put together using the theories of particle physics, that is the standard model. So you have to put together an independent validation of these theories with what you see coming from the early universe, okay? Now, this is a picture that has been shown many, many times. This is the energy budget of the universe, okay? So about two thirds of the universe is made up of a thing that we don't know much about, and we just give it the name dark energy. So about one third of the universe is in the form of matter. One fifth of this one third is normal matter the matter that we know, that we see around us, that we have studied for a few hundred years, the remainder is dark matter, okay? And we don't know very little about that. But let me concentrate on normal matter because that's what we know about, okay? Almost all of normal matter is in the form of baryons, okay? And baryons are particles like protons and neutrons. So that's the energy budget that the universe has. And I told you these protons and neutrons formed at about a microsecond of age when the universe was a microsecond old, about that much. Now, if you want to study 
matter in the early universe, then we have to incorporate both relativity and quantum physics. And that's because in a thermal equilibrium, particles have a kinetic energy, which is roughly equal to the temperature. If two particles collide, the total kinetic energy is also of the order of the temperature. Okay. Now, if the mass of the particle is n, and the temperature, which is the kinetic energy, is much larger than m, the new particles can be produced once two particles collide. Okay. So what I'm saying is that there's this Lorentz factor gamma, which is the energy by mass, which is about which is t by m because energy is of the order of t. If it's much larger than one, which it might be if either the temperature is very high or the mass is small enough, okay, then particles are easily produced in a thermal medium. Okay, now of course the world is quantum, and quantum mechanics is uh, what you must apply. But quantum mechanics is actually fine for problems with a fixed number of particles. You know, if you want to study the spectrum of any atom or molecule, you know, even complicated molecules, isopropyl alcohol is just an example. But you know, any other complicated molecule, then you can to make do with quantum mechanics, okay? We want to understand information transfer through entangled states, okay? Quantum uh, computing and so on. You can deal with quantum mechanics, okay? You want to deal with nanoparticles, you can usually deal with quantum mechanics. But the moment you start talking about processes of particle number changes, okay? Even a simple thing like excited hydrogen, decaying to its ground state and releasing a photon, even such a simple thing, the particle number changes, okay? And then you start to need quantum field theory. So you see clearly, when you are dealing with thermal matter with temperature much, much larger than the mass, then you require both relativity as we discussed and quantum field theory, okay? And what kind of relativistic quantum field theory do we need? All the matter that we know obeys the standard model. So at least we need the standard model at finite temperature for ordinary matter. And for the rest of it, we might need more complex uh, quantum field theories, but we don't know of them yet because we don't know much about dark matter and other things that fill up the universe. Okay. So let me think right now about the standard model at finite temperature. So is the early universe the only place where we need it? And the answer is not really. So let's look at the temperature. At, let's look at the sun. Now the temperature at the surface of the sun is about 6,000 Kelvin. At its core, it's 15 million Kelvin. Okay. I convert this to energy units. Then 6,000 Kelvin is half a EV. And 15 million Kelvin is roughly 1.3 kilo electron volts. Okay. Now, most particle masses are larger than these. So, which means that about the only thing that you can produce in the thermal medium that the sun is made up of are particles which are lighter than this. That's photons, neutrinos, and that's about it. Okay, other things, other particles have larger masses. The electron has half a MeV mass, and that corresponds to a temperature of six giga Kelvin. Okay, the pion is 140 MeV mass, and that's about two tera Kelvin. The proton is one GeV in mass, which is about 10 tera Kelvin. And the Z boson is a 90 GeV in mass, and that's about a peta Kelvin. Okay. So you can't really produce these particles in a star like the sun or even much in a supernova or similar objects, okay? So you might ask, is the standard model at finite temperature only relevant to the early universe? No, it turns out that's not true. You can use colliders to create this matter at high temperature. So heavy ion collisions at LHC in CERN and Rick in Brookhaven lab, they create such conditions. And uh, you know, if we call the universe a big bang, 
then you can call these collisions femtal lines. Okay, so you can either say that we are recreating the Big Bang in the lab, or you can say that these femtal banks that we are making in the lab create the same conditions as the Big Bang. Okay, here's a typical experiment. Now, all I can see in a photo like this is that it's a very complicated experiment. This is a detector for detecting the particles that come out of this uh, femtal bank. This is actually a detector called the ALICE, and it uh, sits in CERN, takes part in the NLC experiment. Okay, you can see that it's enormous. It's really, really large. Okay, when it's in operation, then this red door is closed here. And as a theorist, all that I can see is that there are beam pipes running through the center. That's where the, uh, the hadrons which collide in the large hadron collider run through that. Okay, and somewhere inside this detector, they collide. Okay, and the detector is basically a cylinder built around these beam pipes. Okay. And it catches all the particles that come out of it. So, now, what does quark matter mean? What is this uh, matter that we are trying to understand? The transition, the formation of protons from something called quark matter, something that uh, existed in the universe before it was one microsecond old, okay, or that is created in the femtobanks. So let's understand how normal matter is, what normal matter is, and most of you know that normal matter is made up of quarks and gluons, which are arranged into little packages called protons and neutrons. Okay, so here's a pictorial representation of this. At low temperature, you have these uh, nucleons, uh, protons, neutrons, et cetera, within which have these quarks packaged inside them. If you add a little bit of energy, then you can produce other such packets, particles called pions, kaons, maybe other mesons, other particles which are more exotic, things like hyperons, omegas, other baryons perhaps, okay. But you keep on producing these baryons and mesons and uh, you don't release quarks and gluons, okay. They're still packaged inside them. So this is the kind of matter that we have had in the universe since it was one femtosecond second old. But if you increase the temperature somewhat more, okay, at some temperature, the packaging breaks down and we can see this kind of quark matter, no hadrons anymore, but just quarks and gluons, okay. And that, so what we are seeing then is that the strong interactions, the, the machinery of the strong interactions that you can see only if you look inside with fine enough probes inside hadrons, you'll see that at large distances, okay? And I have told you already that these situations are... Uh, yes, tell me. So like this low temperature to high temperature transition, is this kind of a phase transition type of thing? I'll answer that question very shortly. So okay. can you ask me that question if you don't get the answer? Uh, so in the this kind of matter, then as I told you, existed in the early universe before it was about a microsecond old, or about a microsecond old, or you can produce it in collider experiments with heavy ions, and maybe it turns out you can produce them in neutron stars. That's something that we'll have to try and understand when more data comes in. Okay, so let me answer the question that was just asked. Okay, what is the phase diagram of QCD? At low temperature, confined quarks is what we see. Quarks confined inside hadrons. That's the picture I showed before. And at large temperature, you see deconfined matter, that is quark matter. Okay, the packaging inside hadrons breaks down. Now, what happens, how does it go from one state of matter to another state of matter, from the confined state of matter to the deconfined state of quarks? Okay, does it go through a phase transition? The answer is that it doesn't. Okay, the early universe does not go through a phase transition. The density of, the net density of baryons in the early universe is small enough that it does, that there is no phase transition. There is a, large change of pressure 
entropy and energy density across this transition, across where this one state of matter goes into another state. Okay, but there is no phase transition. These changes are smooth but rapid. Okay, now I could try to compute the properties of matter on this side and on this side using the theory of strong interactions that I have, the part of the standard model that deals with them. Okay, but it turns out that thermodynamics, when we try to understand matter, we have to, at high temperature, we have to understand the thermodynamics of such matter. And thermodynamics only looks at long distance physics. Okay, so think of uh, understanding the thermodynamics of water, ice, or metals, or something. You don't need to know that these materials are made up of atoms in order to understand thermodynamics. Okay, that's because thermodynamics applies at a long distances, at large distances, where these small details do not matter. Okay, but at large distances, theories of this kind, the, the strong interactions have large coupling. So the usual methods of uh, computing in quantum field theory does not work. That's perturbation theory, it does not work. As a result, you require numerical evaluations of all the quantum amplitudes that you need. And that's something that comes from a technique, a numerical technique called lattice gauge theory. But can we understand these, uh, the results of these computations in some easier way? And that's where effective theories come in. When temperature is much less than this crossover temperature, where you know one state of matter goes into another state of matter, that's something I call TCO. Okay, when the temperature is much smaller, then I can think of this thing as a hadron gas. Okay, and the lightest hadron is a pion, so at sufficiently low temperature, I should be able to think of strongly interacting matter as a pion gas, and that actually turns out to work pretty well, okay, quantitatively well. At high temperature, when the temperature is much larger than this crossover temperature, which is somewhere here, okay, weak coupling QCD actually begins to work. But neither of these things explains what happens here when one state of matter changes into another state of matter. And that's the question that I'll ask and try to give you some answers about today. Okay. So I no. have two questions mm -hmm. in the previous slide. So uh, since you have mentioned about this TCO, so what is the estimation of TCO for QCD? Do you want a number or do you want to know? Number, number maybe number. How, number. how it is done? Yeah. You want a number? Yeah. So it's uh, some, I'll give you a number later. It's about 170 uh, MeV. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And for comparison, the pion's mass is 140 MeV. Okay, so that was the phase, the states of strongly interacting matter in the early universe. And I said that in the early universe, the net baryon density is small. Now, the density of baryons can be captured in a quantity called the baryon chemical potential. Okay. Now, here at small baryon density, which corresponds to small chemi baryon chemical potential mu, we actually have this crossover. But it turns out that if you increase mu, then as you increase the temperature, you actually go through a phase transition. Okay. And when mu is large enough, then it's a first order phase transition. When you make mu smaller, sufficiently small, then there's a crossover. And in between these two, somewhere here, you have a second order phase transition, a critical point. And that critical point is something that we have estimated some years back, its location in terms of the uh, TCO that I talked about, the crossover temperature. Okay, so this uh, temperature is uh, the temperature of this point, the critical point is just a little less than TCO and the chemical potential that this corresponds to 
is about twice DCM. Okay. Um, I will not spend too much time on this phase diagram, although except right at the end. So let's go on. So remember that the this plus minus is the theoretical error or uh, some experiment. These are numerical. These are numerical oh. estimates. So these are theoretical errors. Okay. So so most of the talk will be about this end, which is relevant to the early universe, where there's a transition between the confined and deconfined states of matter with no uh, phase transition, a crossover. Now, when I say that, you have to be a little careful because that happens when the pions are massless. Uh, sorry, when the pions are massive as in our universe. But if we had the ability to change, tune the mass of the pions, then you would find that there would be a second order phase transition. In fact, there would be a line of second order phase transitions, okay, starting from mu equal to zero and connecting to this point. Okay, so that's peculiar to what we call the chiral limit, which is the limit when the quark masses go to zero and therefore the pion masses go to zero. Okay, at every finite pion mass, for every finite quark mass, the phase diagram is like this. Okay, so now let's move to uh, effective field theories. Okay, this, I have given you the background. I have given you the basic phenomena that we are trying to understand. And I have told you that many of these numbers are obtained through numerical computation of the quantum amplitudes using lattice gauge theory. But most of the talk, I'll talk about effective theories. Okay, so let me tell you what effective theories are. So think of a very simple problem, okay, a classical problem two balls collide, there's no external force, okay? How do you solve for the motion of these two balls? You would set up conservation of energy and an equation for conservation of momentum, okay? It's a vector equation, okay? You would solve them because you know the initial uh, momenta and energies of the two balls, and that gives you a complete solution about how these two balls go when they collide, okay? If you think of two billiard balls, or, you know, two small ball bearings, this works extremely well, as you know, okay? But is this really the truth? You see, the assumption that I've made is that the balls are rigid, but when two balls collide, you hear a sound, okay? If you're hearing a sound, then the balls must be vibrating which means they are not rigid, okay? So why don't we have to take that into account? So let me ask you a different question. Instead of balls, supposing you threw two balloons at each other, would exactly the same method work? Would you see momentum being conserved? If you use the momentum and energy conservation equations, would you be able to predict the results of two ball balloons colliding? And you know that you know two balloons often do not bounce off each other if they collide. So what happens? Is momentum conserved? Is momentum conservation breaking down? Is energy conservation breaking down? We don't believe that's what's happening. Okay, so what's happening here? What's happening is that we have neglected exactly this elastic energy that every body has, okay? For balloons, that's very important. For billiard balls colliding, the sound that you hear tells you that there is some elastic energy. Okay, so let's think about that. The elasticity is a relationship between something called strain and something called stress. Okay, strain is a tensor. Okay, I'll call it sigma, and it's a dimensionless tensor. Okay. It is something like the amount of deformation divided by the measure of the size of the body, okay? So if a, if a body is under tension, for example, then the strain is the change in length divided by the original unstressed 
length. The stress tensor has dimensions of force per unit area. And so it's something like a pressure in terms of dimensions. And Hooke's law, which relates them, is a law which says that the stress tensor is proportional to the strain tensor. And the con there's a constant of proportionality. There are constants of proportionality which form a tensor. Okay, and that's called the elastic tensor, K. The energy density of the body is the work done by the forces which are keeping the body stressed, the applied forces, okay, in keeping the body under deformation. Okay, so that has to be something like uh, the strain tensor dotted with the, sorry, the stress tensor dotted with the strain tensor, okay, T dot sigma. That must be the energy density, elastic energy density of the body. Okay, and that's of course something when you apply this equation, you see that it's k dot sigma dot sigma. So the scale of elastic energy. So, okay. so uh, is there is any specific property of this fourth rank elastic tensor? Yeah, there are lots of properties. They have to do with the symmetries of the solid and so on. The indices. Sorry, in? No, I'm just saying that there are four indices. Is, is it like, like if you change- It's a rank four tensor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, right. So this is a rank four tensor. I, you know, the specific forms, etc., are not very important. Yeah. Okay. The argument that I'm giving is basically a dimensional argument. Hmm. 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 Okay. So now there's a, a typical scale of the elastic energy which the body contains. Okay. And that is something like K, some magnitude of K times the volume of the body. Because the strain is unlikely to be much larger than the original size of the body. Okay, so that's a typical scale of the elastic energy. It's some estimate of the magnitude of K, which I've called mod K times the volume. Okay, let me call this combination lambda. When the kinetic energy of the colliding bodies, I take it to be E, and when E is much less than lambda, then the strain is small which means that the assumption that the body is rigid should be a reasonable assumption. Now, so, K is different for different objects. Sorry for the interruption. Are you going to identify this lambda to be the cutoff of your effective theory? You wait and see. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, so this K depends upon which body you're talking about. If you're talking about snooker balls, okay then it has a certain K. And uh, when you're talking about balloons, then K is much smaller. Okay, that's why balloons can be deformed easily. Okay, so if you have the same kinetic energy for two balloons and two snooker balls, okay, it may happen that the snooker balls can be considered to be rigid, but at that energy, the balloons cannot be considered rigid. Okay, so that's the difference between the collisions of two snooker balls or two cricket balls or two ball bearings and the collision of two balloons. Okay, so you have to understand how large is the typical kinetic energy of the body with respect to this intrinsic scale of energy that is the elastic energy of the body. Okay, so what I have done is I have taken a complicated problem of colliding bodies and I have written down an effective Hamiltonian using which you can solve for the motion of the bodies. Okay. And this effective Hamiltonian to some leading order is the sum of the kinetic energies of the two balls and a hardcore repulsive contact potential between them. And I completely neglect all the complications of elasticity, okay? And you know that when you're talking about rigid bodies, then this is a very good approximation and you can solve for the motion of rigid bodies using this effective Hamiltonian. Okay, 
And that, as I said, is because there's a natural energy scale in the problem, which is something like, which, is, which I have called lambda, which is something like this mod k times the volume of the body. Okay. And the total kinetic energy is much Hello. less than lambda. The effective theory works extremely well. And you can deal with most problems of engineering with this effective theory. Okay. So that's the answer that you were looking for. Okay. That's the effective Hamiltonian that I've said. And this is the scale. There's a natural energy scale, and the energies involved in this effective Hamiltonian have to be much smaller than this. Okay. When does this effective theory? Yes, you were saying something. Uh, uh, what happens if K is elastic energy of the space-time itself? There's no space-time, you know? Yeah, elasticity of space-time. K, can you there, consider... I'm not talking about uh, anything like that. I'm talking about two balls, two particles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So let's stick to what I'm talking about. Okay, okay. Okay. If you want, you can come back to this question at the end. So the effective theory fails. Let's say that uh, we can measure the failure of this effective theory if the kinetic energy divided by this scale lambda is of the order of 1%. If this energy went fully, if the kinetic energy went fully into the elastic energy, then one would have energy is E equals this uh, energy, elastic energy density times V, which is lambda times delta L by L, where L is the uh, size of the body and delta L is the strain. Okay. And this, of course, is an upper limit because the kinetic energy does not usually go entirely into the elastic energy. Okay. So if you now put this in here, you see that delta L by L is of the order of 10%. Okay. And 10% is a substantial deformation. To, so elastic deformations have to be very substantial for this effective Hamiltonian to fail. So although this effective Hamiltonian is not the reality, it is actually a very good approximation to the dynamics of the bodies. Okay, so that's the first thing to understand that effective theories are theories which work very well below some natural energy scale that you want to work with, okay? But also more than that, there can be sequences of effective theories, okay? So if you go back to your textbook definition of a solid from your school days, uh, the, you'll be told that a solid is something that retains its shape under applications of external forces. A solid does not change its shape or what. Okay, and that is one approximation, but theories of solid investigate how this definition goes wrong. Okay, now this kind of definition gives rise to this rigid body dynamics, which I just described, this effective theory that I just wrote about. Okay, and that's of course uh, such a well understood problem that it's a uh, part of your master's level course in physics. Okay, but when the energy becomes higher, okay, when you have energies which are kind of like the elastic energy, but much less than something else, which I call E slip here, okay, then you enter the regime of elasticity. And this is also a well understood classical problem, 300 years old, okay, and it's sufficiently well understood that today it is part of the undergraduate courses in engineering, okay. Now, E slip is an energy scale at which the body begins to deform permanently, okay? Not just become elastic, that is, it changes shape when you apply the force and then when you let go of the force, it comes back to its original shape, that would be elastic. But if, you, if the forces are large enough that the body deforms, okay, that's called plastic deformation. This is a typical energy scale for that. And beyond this is things are phenomena like crack propagation, fracture, fatigue of materials. And they're all contemporary research level problems. These are things that have been noticed about 60, 70 years back, but they're not completely understood. Okay, so what happens is that we have a 
sequence of effective theories that describe solids and their intrinsic energy scales, this elastic energy, the slip energy, et cetera, which separate the regimes of validity of different effective theories. Okay, this is again another idea that we will use. Okay, so every theory that you deal with could potentially be only an effective theory until you discover a larger scale beyond which this is uh, theory breaks down. Okay, now that was a simple uh, kind of step into effective theories. Okay, but actually what I want to do is to use effective quantum field theories. Okay, now, uh, why is it that this is so very important in a quantum field theory? Okay, first of all, notice that when I have a quantum theory, then the frequencies, for example, of wave functions are proportional to the energy. Okay, and that's what's typically called quantum. I'm sorry, there's a mistake here. It's H bar times energy. Uh, so frequencies are proportional to the energy. And if you're relativistic, then the de Broglie wavelengths are given by, the wavelength L is given by C by omega, okay? Which means that the de Broglie wavelength is inversely proportional to the energy, okay? And you express the same things using natural units, H bar equal to C equal to one, and that tells you that there's only one dimension in the problem and you can take it to be the energy, okay? So the effective cutoff, the, the energy cutoff of the effective theory, which I call lambda in the example that I uh, gave earlier, okay, there'll be similar cutoffs in energy for every effective field theory that you write down, okay. But because of all these relations, it also corresponds to a short distance cutoff, okay. So you try to uh, use all the energies below a certain scale lambda, which means you are talking about distance scales which are much larger than one by lambda or time scales which are much larger than one by lambda, okay? And uh, if you look at it this way, then uh, you have a certain gain because dimensional analysis becomes a very, very powerful tool for constructing these effective field theories, okay? And that's how we will approach it, okay? You could think of it in another way through the Wilsonian renormalization uh, approach to quantum field theories. Okay, so you have some UV complete quantum field theory and you want to get some long distance correlators out of them. Okay, long distance corresponds to some low momentum Q. Okay, in order to do this, you have to take the path integral that defines your UV quantum field theory and integrate over all virtual momentum, okay, to get down to this scale Q. Now you could do that if you are able to, or you could integrate all virtual momenta greater than lambda, and you then get the effective field theory, which is exactly equivalent to this, exactly well, which is equivalent to this, okay, for energies or momenta, much less than lambda. So you could get these same correlators now using this effective field theory if you can do this integration. Okay. Now notice that when you do these integrals, you do not change the global symmetries. Okay. So this effective field theory usually has the symmetries of the UV quantum field. And that's something that we call universality. And that's an important aspect of these effective field theories, it's kind of a very Wilsonian way of looking at things, this universality approach. But we have a little bit more than that, okay? Not just universality, not just symmetries going through from high energies to low energies, from short distances to long distances, but a little bit more than that. And that's the dimensional analysis part, okay? In the EFT Lagrangian, you... so. Retain, yeah. This yeah. In UV complete theory of QFT, here no contribution from gravity is considered. I'm talking about basically standard model. Okay, okay, okay. okay. And our quantum field theories which are, which may be bigger than the standard model, 
but mm -hmm. much smaller than the Planck length because, of course, gravity brings in yet another scale, intrinsic yes. scale. True, true. Okay. True. So that will change the way we do things. Right. Right. So we will think yeah. of uh, effective theories which are below the, or UV complete theories, which still describe the physics below the Planck scale. Sure. Okay. Okay. okay so the, the previous question was also something to do with this. That's why I deferred that question. Okay. So, right. Where was I? Yeah. So this is, this is the next step is dimensional analysis. So in the EFT Lagrangian, you could have different, uh, different uh, kinds of EFT Lagrangians, different, uh, which, which have the same universality, but they give you better and better approximations to the correlators, okay? You could do that if you retain all possible terms up to dimension, some dimension B, okay? All possible terms in the EFT, which satisfy a certain symmetry, up to dimension B, using operators of up to dimension D, mass dimension B, of course, okay? If you do this, then the correlators that you're interested in are reproduced accurately up till order Q by lambda to the power D, okay? So if you put in more and more higher dimensional terms, okay, then you'll get more and more accurate numerically accurate results for the correlators, okay? So in that sense, you have a little bit more than universality, actually substantially more than universality. Okay, now this of course gives you a shortcut. You don't have to do this integration, okay? You can just use this shortcut. Symmetries dictate the Lagrangian, so write down all possible terms, okay? Up to a certain dimension D all possible terms that can go into a Lagrangian. And you just examine terms one by one by one. Okay, since the dimension is fixed, there's only a finite number of terms. Okay, examine them one by one. Okay, if they satisfy the symmetry, then you keep it. Okay, for each term in the Lagrangian, there's a coupling constant, which is unknown. Okay, and this is called a low energy constant, typically LEC, okay. And, uh, you know, you'll have to match, you'll have to find a value of these unknown constants by matching to some correlator, okay? So you have to give enough inputs to match all the, to, to get the, all the unknown constants, okay? And then you have defined the EFT Lagrangian completely, and then you can use it to give other correlators. They're all predictions, okay? So here's the, recipe for creating an effective field theory. My intent is to construct a QFT for a long distance, slow dynamics of some system. Okay. Number one, step number one, choose a cutoff momentum below which you want this description. Okay. So you choose the UV cutoff and you look at momenta, which are much smaller than this UV cutoff. I call this Q in the previous transparency, so let's use this slight change of notation. Identify the global symmetries of the system. Okay, the symmetries are important. They are part of the universality argument that you're going to use. Okay. Next, think of all the fields on which these symmetries act. So maybe you have some number of fermion fields, some number of boson fields, okay. You identify which fields these symmetries act. Okay, and then the next step is just mechanical. Write down all possible terms in the action of the Lagrangian using these fields and their derivatives, okay? And keeping only the terms which are invariant under the symmetric group G. High dimensional terms are down by powers of lambda. So if you want to keep a certain accuracy, keep terms up to some dimension n, then you get the accuracy P by lambda to the power n. And as I said before, you could have many couplings in the theory and sufficient data is needed to fix this. Everything else is a prediction, okay? And this is a process which comes down to us from you know, 
something like 40 years, 70 years ago. This is Weinberg Wilson. So. Okay. So now if I were going to apply this to the strong interactions at finite temperature, then I need to identify the global symmetries of the strong interactions. And they are an approximate chiral symmetry, which becomes exact when the quark masses are zero. So there's an SU2 left times the SU2 right, and the SUN left, SUN right, and N is the number of flavors. Okay. This symmetry is explicitly broken by the quark masses and uh, broken down actually to a diagonal symmetry, the vector symmetry. And it's spontaneously broken even when the quark masses vanish. Okay. Now you have to ask, what is the number of flavors? What is it that you want in your EFT? In order to answer that, you have to remember that the scale anomaly of QCD, it generates an intrinsic scale, which we call lambda QCD. Okay, there's a scale in the quantum theory. And when the quark masses are much larger than lambda QCD, then they are not part of the chiral symmetry. Okay, so then you don't want to retain them in the effective field theory. So if you want to do that, then you can choose NF equal to two or three. And in this uh, talk, I'll choose it to be two, okay? Because it's simpler, because it's the first exercise. That's the internal global symmetry. But I also want everything at finite temperature. And here, there's the difference between what most people do and what we do, okay? Remember that uh, when you have a finite temperature, then there's a special frame. This is the frame in which the heat bath is at rest, okay? So Lorentz invariance is explicitly broken by the presence of a heat bath, okay? What remains are the spatial invariances, which are rotations, parity, etc. okay? Time reversal invariance remains, and uh, CP symmetry remains, okay? Remember that Lorentz invariance is broken, but it's still a relativistic theory, because Lorentz invariance is broken by selecting a frame. Okay. Now, because of this, temporal and spatial components of vectors can be distinguished. Okay. And similarly, different com components of tensors can also be distinguished. The theory is still relativistic in the sense that momenta that I'm talking about are much larger than the masses. Okay. So there is Lorentz covariance, but not Lorentz invariance. The counting of mass dimensions remains unchanged because of this. Okay, so we had worked out this thing in 92 and Larry Affe had continued this work in 95. Now, what do you, once you have these symmetries, what can you do? What I really want to understand, as I told you earlier, is to have a model of physics around the QCD crossover. Okay, and I want to answer questions about thermodynamics and you know, things which are departures from equilibrium. And one of the questions that we want to ask is whether the same excitations determine what is the dynamics and what is the thermodynamics? Are they really the same things, same degrees of freedom? Okay. Now, so there's some temperature, some special temperature T0, and we want to describe physics of correlation functions at momenta p, which is very long distance. So momenta p are much less than t0. Maybe not at all temperatures, but maybe in some temperature range around t0, okay? So if t0 is uh, something, if the crossover temperature is something, I don't want that effective theory to work at uh, zero temperature. I don't want it to work at uh, 1 million times the temperature t0 but I want it to work in some region around T0. So I, I lower my expectations of this effective field theory, and therefore I gain more power, it will turn out, okay? Now, of course, you understand that the EFT cannot give the full dynamics, okay? So some parts of the pressure, some parts of the equation of state, okay, must reach, must be out of reach, okay? Because you have truncated momenta, you're not taking all momenta into account, okay? 
what we expect to find are the universal soft parts, which are dominated by the symmetries. So we can expect to find maybe the phase diagram and so on. Okay. And the symmetries that I have written down here include the chiral symmetry. So which is really exactly valid at zero quark masses. And one question that we'll have to understand is how large can the quark masses become before this theory that I write down becomes invalid? Okay, so these are all kinds of questions that you I'll want to ask. I'll not address all of them in this talk, but I'll address some of them. Okay, next thing I want to do is to give you a simple version of such a hot effective field theory. Okay, for hadrons. And, and when I say a simple version, I this is my picture of it. You know, you see a bird in silhouette. And if you can see the shape of the bird, that should be enough for me. That's the kind of simplicity, some long distance physics that I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the genes of this bird or the cells of this bird, but just overall shape. Okay. So I'm going to say this once more. Okay. The typical momenta that you have in a relativistic gas is of order temperature. And we have taken a representative temperature called T0. We want correlators at distances much greater than one by T0. So we can take a UV cutoff, lambda, which is about P0. And then we consider the fermion fields because fermion fields are the ones which carry the, uh, the chiral symmetry. Okay, and we don't have to take any other fields here. Okay, uh, Shantan, I would like to break here for a couple of minutes. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. No problem. So when I come back, I'll switch on the. Uh, uh, but the, I'll the, the mic slide, switched on. But... Yeah, so this slide remains okay. But you just don't. Uh, yeah. yeah. So when yeah, you I'll, come back, you just start speaking again. Yeah. Thanks for waiting. Perfect. You can start. Okay. Uh, shall I start? Yeah, sure. Okay. So we'll consider fermion fields. Okay. And fermion fields will have, uh, will come in two flavors or NF flavors. Okay. NC colors and four Dirac components. So the number of dimensions of the fermion field is this curly N, which is four NFNC. Okay, now let's write down the kinetic terms. Now, kinetic terms are dimension four objects. Okay, Lorentz invariance has been broken because of the special frame that we have, but the theory has remained relativistic. So we should retain P, C, P, and C, P, T symmetries. We should retain spatial rotations. So the only kinetic terms that we can write down, only dimension four terms that we can write down in a theory with fermions is these two terms, psi bar, gamma four, d four psi. I'm working, I should remind you, I'm working in the Euclidean, so gamma four is the Euclidean gamma matrix. 
and that's one term. And then there's another term which involves psi bar gamma i di, which is which I've given by this uh, slashed gradient term psi bar gamma i di psi. And they could, of course, have different coefficients. Okay. So we'll choose the coefficient. In this del slash, is there any kind of interaction is taken care because it is kind of looking like some covariant derivative? No, it is not a covariant derivative. Oh, it's okay. just gamma i di. Okay. okay, I haven't I haven't put in interactions yet. Okay, it's just and, a pure kinetic moment. And this okay. del four is basically the spatial derivative. No, d four is the Euclidean time derivative. Oh, time. Okay, okay, okay. Euclidean time, and this is the space. So, oh, okay, okay. Now I can understand the notation. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I'll say this again. I'll take four vectors to be uh, V1, V2, V3, which are the spatial components, and V4 for the Euclidean time component. When I talk about Minkowski, then I'll take the spatial uh, components V1, V2, V3, and the time component will be V0. Okay, so gamma four is the Euclidean time direction gamma matrix. Okay, and the gamma i di in the spatial directions has gone into this symbol. The so be, be, because of the presence of d four, your Lorentz symmetry is broken. I think because the Lorentz symmetry is broken, therefore d four is allowed. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Mm, it's the other way around. I, I, I have to think about the symmetries first. Okay, so in uh, a Lorentz symmetric case, D4 was fixed to be one. Symmetry dictated that uh, D4 should be one. Okay, and then of course the coefficient of everything is fixed by field renormalization. Here, what we will do is we will have to fix the field renormalization, and I'll use the gamma four D4 term to fix the field renormalization. So that remains exactly as in the uh, Lorentz invariant theory, and uh, there'll be one extra coupling D4, which arises for the dimension four terms in a fermion theory of this kind. Okay, so that's the new low energy constant, which I have to fix. And if this theory is natural, then naturalness will tell me that D4 should be of the order of one, not exactly equal to one, but maybe not terribly different from one either. Okay, that's the dimension four term. Now, if I want to write the interacting theory, which contains only fermions, okay, then the only, the next thing that I should look at is dimension six terms. And that's what the interactions look like. Okay, the dimension six terms, there's a chiral symmetry, okay. So that terms, the scalar term and the pseudo-scalar term have come with the same coefficient here, okay? Similarly, that symmetry dictates relations between various other terms. Instead of just the bilinear, scalar bilinear and the pseudo-scalar bilinear, I have to write down all possible bilinears, which have dimension six, and have the same have are invariant under the symmetry. Okay. Now, of course, you know that this first term is the Lagrangian is the interaction term in the number so journal. Just, just, just one theory. clarification. So shy is basically three by two mass dimension, I think. So yes, that's, right. uh, that's why you have to suppress by t naught square every term. So otherwise, it will not be four dimensional. Lagrange. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then, therefore, since you said that, therefore, uh, D61 in the first line is a dimensionless coupling. Okay. True. Now, this first line is something that you may have already met. It's the Lagrangian of the Nambu Jonala senior model. Okay. But that's a model, and we, we want to write down is an effective field theory. So it's not sufficient to write down just these two terms. 
we must write down all possible terms containing four fermion fields, okay, which have the chiral symmetry. And I've just written them all down. Turns out that there are 10 combinations that you can write down, okay. And so there are 10 LECs, low energy constants, apart from the D4, there are 10 more that come if you start taking interactions into account. Okay, and that's for dimension six operators. I've also taken two flavor uh, theory, two flavors of fermions. So there is the flavor generator, which I've called tau A. Tau A is the poly matrices acting on the flavor space. That's why I said SU2 cross SU2 chiral symmetry. Okay, any questions here? Uh, so uh, just last question, what capital A stands for the matrices? Or the uh, that's the, that's the uh, okay, so there, so I'm working with four dimension in four dimensions. Okay, so there are 16 gamma matrices. Uh -huh. oh, these are the things that transform as uh, four tensors. Okay. Two tensors in four dimensions uh -huh. space. Okay, so those are usually seen in uh, Dirac, uh, you know, theory. You'll yeah. see them as the generators of the Lorentz transformations. But there are two kinds. There's there are things which involve the uh, the the boosts, which are SI four, mm -hmm. okay, and rotations, which are SIJ. Perfect. Okay, so these are the terms that I can write down. Lots of uh, elicis, so it looks like it's going to be hard to pin down. So the next question is, what do we do with this Lagrangian? Okay. Dimension four terms that I've written down, dimension six terms which I have demonstrated here. Okay, what where do I go next? So the first thing that we could do is to write down the mean field theory. Okay. If I start constructing a mean field theory, then I can make field transformations of the fields and they'll collapse all dimension six couplings into one coupling. Okay, so you'll get an effective coupling which is a linear combination of all 10 couplings D6I, 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 Okay, so there's a particular linear combination which comes out in mean field theory, okay, which is this. Okay, so that's what the interaction terms become. Now, if you add a dimension three term, which is what a mass term would look like, then that's something like this, okay? Again, I could have written mass times psi bar psi, but instead in the same spirit of writing dimensionless low energy constants, I'm writing the mass as D3 times D0, okay? So of course, you've already seen the D4 coupling. So there are three couplings, okay? Lambda, D3, D4, all dimensionless couplings, lambda, D3, D4. And these are the couplings which I have to fix in mean field theory for any choice of T0. So we proceed, we write down the mean field theory, then we construct the free energy of this model. And when you start writing the free energies, then you require regularization because a free energy is a loop calculation. Uh, you could use any regularization, but it turns out to be simple to use dimensional regularization, although this is a not a Lorentz symmetric theory, okay. It's still easy to do dimensional regularization. So that's what we do. And if we do regularization, then of course you have to introduce a regularization scale mu, okay. So in the chiral limit, the effective field theory has a phase transition. This is something that I have told you before. There is a critical temperature for a phase transition. Okay, and this critical temperature I call Tc. This is a prediction of the theory when all the parameters are known. But you know, there's only one dimension full parameter in the effective field theory, okay, and that's T0. So of course you can trade T0 and Tc. So you could, for example, choose T0 to be Tc. 
Okay. Now, if you do that, then there's a gap equation which you can write, which fixes lambda completely. It turns out, I'm not showing you the calculation, I'm just quoting the calculation to you. And uh, so what we have done is we have dimensional transmutation, the data on the crossover temperature at finite D3, that's the TCO, okay, that we get, and the pion correlator is used, and that's all used to get TC, D3, D4, okay. And I can do this at any order. In particular, I could do this to one loop order in this effective field theory. Okay, so in other words, we put in some of the data on the correlation functions, okay, the pion correlation functions, and then we get all the couplings. Okay, the process is clear. I'm not giving any proofs and not showing you the calculations, I'm just telling you the process. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, great. So then I told you that there's a renormalization scale, okay, a regularization scale mu. And once I fix mu, I have extracted the LECs by fitting observed correlation functions to the LECs. But if you change mu, then these values that you have extracted for the LECs will change. And that's how renormalization group works for the EFT. Okay, it's a reflection of how the renormalization group works for a UV complete theory. Now, TCO, the crossover temperature, has been measured in the lattice. Okay, the effective field theory actually predicts TCO in terms of TC, TC is T0. So, matching the effective field theory actually gives us a prediction for TC in the chiral limit. Okay, so if I put in the lattice calculation of T crossover at finite quark mass, and I use the effective field theory to get TCO in terms of T0, which is TC, then I get a prediction for TC. Now, if I use the lattice measurements, then I find using the effective field theory that TCO is 1.24 plus minus a certain number. This comes from the lattice, uh, statistical errors of the lattice. Okay, TCO is this much times T0. And if I put in the numbers for TCO from the lattice, then I get that TC is 170 plus minus six MeV. Okay, uh, is everything under control? Is this number believable? No. On the lattice, power corrections are important. Okay, this has been shown by two collaborations, which are the Budapest Wuppertal and uh, Riken, Brookhaven, et cetera, et cetera, uh, collaboration. Okay, the power corrections for TC, but there are no power corrections in MS bar. Okay, so the lattice has power corrections, but this result has no power corrections. So how are we sure that this doesn't have Systematic errors, this estimate of mine. The thing to remember is that the lattice is a UV cutoff, which is one by lattice spacing, one by A. Okay, and the EFT has a UV cutoff, which is TC. Now, if the ratio of the two uh, UV cutoffs is much less than one, okay, then I can use the effective field theory without making an error. Okay, and that's the condition. And that condition turns out to be satisfied. Okay, so the moral of the story is that this result that I've got is accurate. Okay, so that's it. Uh, just to throw a remark, you have statistical errors in the lattice measurement. So when you use the lattice measurements to fix the LECs, then of course those errors induce errors in the LECs that we get. Although there's no theoretical uh, error on the loop calculations that you're doing, the lattice errors get reflected in the errors in indices. Okay, what else can we do? So we have got all the low energy constants and we are ready to do more calculations. 
So now what can we do? Okay. We can look at fluctuations around the mean field. We have used the mean field to get the helices. We have got the whole Lagrangian now. And now we can look at fluctuations. Okay. And the way we look at fluctuations is to use the Hubble Stratton-Rich mechanism. Okay. So which introduces pion fields in the usual way. Okay. And we have to input some typical scale F for the pion field. Okay, in if you look at Weinberg's book, if you look at the old uh, chiral theories, then the scale F is the pi on decay constant F pi. Okay, but here we are working at finite temperature, so I'll not make this as assumption. I'll not make this identification. Okay, so we use this. We write down. Pion fields, we trade these uh, fermion fields for pion fields, okay, and we will integrate over the quark fields and we'll get an effective theory for pions. But that effective field, for, uh, field theory for pions, I already know what it, form it should have because of the construction that I told you about before, okay. There are dimension two terms, pi squared terms with coefficient which is m pi, okay. I think there should be a half here. Uh, then there's a kinetic term. The kinetic term has broken up into two pieces. Okay, there's a time component and there's a space component to the kinetic term. They have come with different coefficients. So I'll use this to fix the normalization of the parent field and the other term has u squared. And then the only possible term that I can write down is a pi-fold interaction term. Okay. Now, a theory like this, if you write down a Lagrangian like this, you see immediately that axial charge conservation is broken by this, by the dimension three mass term. And if you come down to the pion theory, then it gives you uh, some rule, okay, finite temperature some rule. Some rule goes by the name of Gelman, uh, so GMOR, some rule. Uh, so what we have done now is we have a, microscopic derivation of this sum rule. And we have a systematic extension to new and higher order terms in the pion EFT. In fact, this term that I've given in red is a new term that we have found. Okay. And now we can go ahead with that. We can find pion two point functions. Pion two point functions will have this form. Okay, it's obvious because you have quadratic term and that gives you the two-point function. Okay, so the leading order, this is the propagator, standard propagator. If you take the Q4 going to zero limit, you get this, okay. So, uh, Shorendu, you have written the this pion Lagrangian in the Euclidean signature, probably. Yes, that's correct, D0. Good, you put it on. Like computing the correlators in the uh, Lorenzian signature, is it complicated or? Like it just I'll come to that. That's an interesting question. That's a very interesting question. You can't do it in the lattice. You'll have to use the EFT. So I'll come to that question. Okay. 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 You can, if your question is not answered, ask me later. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is the form of the pine correlator that you'll get from that dimension four Lagrangian that I wrote down. Okay. And if you take the limit of Q4 going to zero, then you'll get a, a pine correlation function, which is like this. And if you have studied any, any finite temperature field theory, okay, you'll realize that this is a screening correlation function and it has a screening mass, which is m pi by u. Okay. The other thing that you can do is you have a pion correlator. You can also ask for current current correlation functions. Okay. And they have this form. Okay. They, they differ from this thing by just taking this thing and multiplying it by 2f squared q mu squared. Okay, so if you take the a4 component and find the correlation function of the a4, a4 component, axial current a4, then you get a q4 squared. If you look at the momentum, then you get a qi squared, okay, times u squared. Always every qi squared comes with a u squared because of 
this factor. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so I can find the axial current correlators are related to the prion correlation functions. And that's something that people knew at uh, zero temperature. It goes through almost unmodified at finite temperature. That's interesting. So once we have these relations, we can match the pion correlation functions. Okay. And in many different ways, and some of these ways are used as checks of other ways, or you can treat them as uh, predictions and so on. Okay. The other thing you find is that this uh, F by T, F was that scale that you had introduced. F by T is of order unity, and it does not depend on the temperature at all across the crossover. Okay. So it turns out that the domain of validity of the pion effective theory is not very different from that of the fermion effective theory because f is the scale at which the firm f is the uv scale for the fermions okay t is the uv scale for the sorry f is the uv scale for the pions and t is the uv scale for the fermions okay if f by t is of order unity then the two uv scales are similar Okay, so the pion effective theory and the fermion effective theory have very so, similar means of value. I have one more question. Maybe it's not very relevant here, but the similar type of decay constant also observed for, not observed in the appearing in the theory of axions. So yes, there, absolutely. Yeah, there, there people used to sometimes take uh, this F to be sometime, sometimes time dependent. So yes. like, is it possible to have the time dependence in the pion decay constants also? See, the thing is, if you want to have pion, uh, so if you want to do that, then the time variation of these parameters has to be much smaller mm -hmm. than the scale at which you're applying the, uh, you know, they have to be, the scale at which you're looking at the dynamics has to be decoupled from the scale of change of the Lagrangian. Okay. Right. Yeah. So yeah. now I'm looking at the extreme infrared. Okay. So that has to change faster. You know, so there's some problem there. Okay. Yes. We can discuss this offline if you're interested. Okay. Okay. Sure. No problem. Okay. It's an interesting question. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, sure, sure. You please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So when I do, the, when I have, when I finish all these calculations, then I have an interacting pion theory. What I wrote here was just the tree level correlation function. I can actually go beyond that and take the one loop uh, correlation function. Okay. Or I can do a Schwinger Dyson resummation, uh, which is called a bubble resummation of this. Okay. When I do that, then I find that the effective field theory gives a wonderful match to the lattice results for the pion correlation function over a very interesting range of temperatures. Okay. So here what I've done is I have fixed the parameters of the model using this one measurement, okay, just below TC. And then I have extrapolated this to a range above TC. So pi on above TC. And that can happen because I have a crossover. So if I had a phase transition, then the pi on would be restricted to being below TC. But here I can go above DC. Okay, now you have various approximations. If I take this tree level approximation, just this first term, then that's the blue band that I have shown here. Okay, and that's kind of low. If I just add the one loop term, then I get the green band, which is somewhat high. So, but the, th the thicker band, band is like, how much statistical accuracy? 
this is all one sigma. Oh, okay. And uh, the lighter one, two sigma or whatever. Yeah, right. One, si one sigma here, two sigma here. Okay, okay. So, so as I said, the blue is corresponds to just the tree level, this diagram for the correlation function. The green corresponds to just the single one loop correction to that. And the yellow is the resummed Schwinger Dyson propagator. Okay. And that resummation, starting from here, you can extrapolate it to well above the critical, uh, sorry, the crossover temperature. Okay. That's very, very interesting because that means that the pion theory continues to work, you know, 10% into the, at least 10% into the high temperature phase, the quark phase of QCD. So hadrons, and that's what, that's a direct uh, kind of evidence that this is a crossover and not a uh, phase transition because hadrons, like pions continue to be seen in the high temperature quark matter phase. Okay, so that's so the numerical in, part. In, in this simulation, uh, in this particularly 0.9, this uh, T by T CO 0.9, is that playing some significant role? Because after that, things are deviating. So what that corresponds to in this particular- No, no, there's no deviation. You see, they're all within two sigma. Okay, okay. So even here, it's in one sigma actually. Okay. okay. Hmm, this is one sigma band. Okay. Okay, so statistically, this is a perfect fit. Start using only this as an input, we get a perfect fit up to this point. Hmm, 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 hmm. Okay. Okay. Maybe I, I have misinterpreted initially, but now it is clear to me. Okay. okay. Yes. Right. Okay, then I go on. And now we come to the question that you asked. Okay. And that's called the big sign problem of lattice QCD. Okay. So lattice computations are done entirely in the Euclidean QFT. And there's a big question. How do you get from these Euclidean results to Minkowski results? Because the non-perturbative lattice computations are done in Euclidean, and we have no non-perturbative method in Minkowski unless we can do this analytic continuation. So I can phrase the question this way, or equivalently, I can phrase the question in the following way. You have correlators measured non-perturbatively through lattice, correlators C of Q, Q is a momentum, with Q squared greater than zero. Okay, that's the Euclidean correlator. And if you want to continue to Minkowski, then you need to know how to continue that to Q squared less than zero. Okay. And here we, I am giving you an answer. We have built a sequence of EFTs, a Pion EFT, which is contained within the NGL EFT, the quark EFT that I wrote down, which is contained within QCD. And use the simplest of these EFTs, which is the Pion EFT. Okay. This is the Pion EFT that I had written down. Okay and use that to continue. Since this Pion EFT matches the lattice calculations here, then whatever you use uh, here to fit these data, these uh, input parameters, m pi u c41, okay, the same values of m pi u and c41 can be used in Minkowski. Okay, so just do the calculation with this simple Lagrangian. Now, if you use this Lagrangian, notice that there are three masses, okay? There's the rest mass M pi, which appears directly in the Lagrangian, and therefore it's called the pole mass, okay? And there's a screening mass, which I had told you earlier about, M pi by U, which is this thing, okay? And we have a kinetic mass, M pi by U squared. What is this kinetic mass? Notice that when you start with a kinetic term like this, that gives you a energy, which is the dispersion relation is energy equals m pi squared plus u squared q mod squared. Q is the spatial momentum. 
right? Take the square root and expand it out in the usual way, assuming that m pi is large, much larger than q. Uh, then you get m pi, which is the rest mass, plus the kinetic term. Okay, kinetic term as a coefficient, which is which we call the kinetic mass. And you can see immediately that this kinetic mass is n pi by u squared. Okay, so there are three different masses that you could use in the as a pion mass, and you have to be careful about which one you are talking about. So, I, so I'll show you results for all of them. This is the result for the device screening mass. I have already shown you this. I don't need to discuss this further. Then I go to the kinetic mass. Okay, and the kinetic mass. There's a big difference between the free level and the uh, one loop. But when you do the one loop resummation, then the kinetic mass is actually stabilized. Okay, it's somewhere in between. So that's the kinetic mass that we could get. And this is the rest mass of the pion. As you can see, the rest mass falls. If I work at uh, in the chiral limit where there's exactly a phase transition, then this this mass would go to zero at the phase transition. But here we have a crossover, so this thing goes up. Okay. So the two interesting things that happen out here is one that the pion theory, pion effective theory, can be used both below and above TC, TCO crossover. Okay, so there are pions in both phases of the theory. And the second is the question that Shantanu asked some time back. Okay, can we use this EFT to calculate real time dynamics? And the answer is you can, and you get all these funny phenomena, different kinds of masses and so on. Okay, these are not things that you would have known if you didn't do this analysis. Okay. Uh, now, before I go on to the last part of the talk, do you want me to explain anything here? You are saying something? Oh, I'm asking any questions? No, you proceed. People will ask okay. questions. Up to this point, it is clear. Okay, great. So now I'll just add a little more detail. Okay, as I said, I gave you an outline of what this bird looks like. But experimentalists sometimes want a little more detail. Okay, what are the colors and so on? So that's what I'll tell you how to do. And I, I'll, the reason I'm telling you this is because I want to tell you that the effective field theory approach is very, very uh, malleable. You can get more and more information about it. Okay. So the next thing I'll ask is what happens if I break certain symmetries? Okay. I have told you before that chiral symmetry is broken if once you put quark masses, okay. But now you remember that the quark mass is broken in the is put in the UV complete theory that is QCD, okay. And when you break a symmetry by a low dimensional term in the UV, then when you cascade down to IR, then it generates terms of higher and higher dimensions, okay. So, uh, so the symmetry breaking due the axial symmetry breaking, chiral symmetry breaking due to mass in QCD, we have not used it really to generate other terms in the effective Lagrangian, and you realize we must do that. Okay. The other thing that I'll be interested in is the so-called lattice sign problem which is how do you introduce a baryon chemical potential into the Euclidean theory, okay? Again, remember that the baryon chemical potential is something that is present already in QCD, that is in the UV theory. And the baryon chemical potential is put through a term of this kind, psi bar gamma four psi, which is the number operator, times mu, okay? And this is a dimension three term. Mu is a dimensional object, right? So this dimension three term breaks CP symmetry or time reversal symmetry in the UV theory. So when it comes, when you cascade down to the IR theory, the effective field theory, then this generates such symmetry breaking terms even in the IR. 
Okay. And these new symmetry breaking terms, I must take into account if I want to understand the effective field theory at finite baryon chemical potential. Okay. So I'll not belabor this point. I'll just write down the, I'll just show you an example of the kind of terms that you get. There's, there are no dimension four terms that you generate, but there are dimension six terms that you generate. Okay. Basically, the axial symmetry, is, the chiral symmetry is gone. So for every term that you had earlier in the quark theory, you would have a partner term here, okay, with independent uh, coupling constants. And the CP symmetry breaking also gives rise to a certain number of terms, but a much smaller number of terms. Okay, so you get more indices. And uh, you would do the mean field theory again. There will be two kinds of mean field theories. One will be a uh, mean field for chiral symmetry breaking and another mean field for CP symmetry breaking. That is a number density. Okay. And it turns out that there are three independent combinations of LECs now. Earlier we had only lambda. Now there will be a lambda and there will be a new term lambda prime and a third term kappa. In the mean field Lagrangian, they appear in this way. One term with this psi bar psi, okay. Another term with this number operator, okay. See the number of the this psi bar psi has a leading term, which is the mass. The number operator comes with the leading coefficient, which is the chemical potential, and then there are correction terms, okay. And of course, the kinetic term remains, and then there are various non-dynamical terms. It turns out that this uh, kappa, this uh, coupling constant, is like mass times chemical potential divided by T0. And so if you are working in the chiral limit, this, this term kappa does not matter. Okay. So in the chiral limit, instead of three LSCs, I have only two LSCs. One which we have met before and the new one. Okay, what is the effect of this? The effect of this is when you look at TC, how TC varies with mu, you find that there could be a variation. Okay, you take this TC at mu, at finite mu divided by T0, which is TC at mu equal to zero. Okay, you'll have an expansion of this kind at finite mu. Okay, my kappa, kappa four are shape constants. Okay, for this curve of TC. And if you have a circle, if TC as a function of mu looks like a circle, then there's a certain relation between kappa four and this leading term. So you could compute this leading term and you could compute something that gives you a deviation from a circle. Don't worry about this, okay. So let me just look at this term, okay. Uh, if uh, you almost have a, Circle. Okay. So here's a numerical calculation within the effective field theory of TC as a function of mu against mu. Okay, everything given in units of TC. And uh, how do you know that this is a circle? Because I have mu squared here, I have TC squared. Okay, so a circle should become a straight line, which it does for different values of this uh, coupling constant. And these, uh, this kappa, this curvature of the circle has been measured on the lattice. So here's a set of measurements. And you can, I show here that you can easily tune the coupling in the effective theory to match these things. Okay, these are the most dependable numbers. So uh, couplings are like this, okay. So the moral of the story is that you can get the, get more than the pion properties. You can get actually the whole phase diagram of QCD from things like this. Okay. So I'll stop here. Okay. What I've told you is that uh, if you want to understand the early universe, you need to understand uh, physics at multiple scales at finite temperature. Okay. And you can test this physics at finite temperature at colliders. Okay. And therefore, you know that you require more sophistication than just uh, non-interacting uh, theories, okay?
the effective field, what I have tried to tell you is that the effective field theory at finite temperature predicts many generic phenomena and they will be important as we understand and try to pin down uh, more accurately the temperature dependence of the early universe physics. Okay, effective field theories are great tools for doing such things. Okay, I'll stop here. And if you have questions, you can ask. Uh, thank you, uh, Shorendu, for your nice contribution. Um, I can't see many participants, one participant left. Do you have any question? Shantan, you are, I can't hear you actually. Can you able to hear me right now? So. Now you can able to hear me. I'm afraid I cannot hear you. Can you able to hear me again? Can you hear me? Yes. I seem to have lost you. <laughs> now, I think his network is uh, not good. Uh, Ganesh, I can hear you. You can't hear me now. Shantan is back. Shantan can hear you. Hi. We lost you for a while. You're muted. Shantan, you're muted. Yeah. So I think connection from my side is not good. Yours perfectly okay. So okay. sorry for the interruption, but uh, do you have any question, Ganesh? If not, please uh, give a clap for him for giving such a nice contribution. Thanks. At, uh, uh, thank you, Sorendu, for your uh, patience. And I, I like I can understand that you are not doing very well. You are uh, uh, you have just taken the vaccination. So uh, stay safe and healthy. That's more important. And uh, thanks. Hope to see you uh, soon, some other time when I will be at TIFR. And uh, yeah. Hope things will uh, change soon, whatever going on. Yeah, I hope I, I hope we can all travel and yeah meet again. Yeah, like we so, we all are stuck more than a year right now. I think. Yes. So, okay. So all the best to you. Thanks. And see you. Thanks. Bye. Okay.